you hear me? I am delighted and honored to receive a special prize in fundamental physics. I would like to thank Yuri Milner for founding these prizes to recognize outstanding work that may not qualify for the Nobel Prize because it is very difficult or impossible to confirm experimentally. In my case, although almost every theoretical physicist agrees with my prediction that a black hole should glow like a hot body, it would be very difficult to verify experimentally. The temperature of a macroscopic black hole is so low. I thought my discovery would never be confirmed or recognized. However, it could be claimed that it has already been indirectly confirmed by observations of the microwave background. It is thought that the very early universe underwent a period of accelerating or inflationary expansion. This would create conditions similar to a black hole and would give the universe an effective temperature. Thermal fluctuations in the very early universe would be frozen in and would cause small differences in the microwave background in different directions. These have been observed and agree with predictions. The thermal emission from black holes is important because it shows that black holes have intrinsic entropy, and it shows that there is a deep connection between gravity and thermodynamics. It plays a key role in the ADS-CFT duality. I have also made contributions to cosmology. My early work with Roger Penrose showed that classical general relativity predicted the universe had a beginning in a Big Bang singularity. That the universe had a beginning in the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago is now accepted by most people working in cosmology and is supported by the discovery of a faint background of microwaves. The prediction of singularities indicates that classical general relativity breaks down and has to be replaced by a quantum theory of gravity. Jim Hartle and I proposed that the quantum state of the universe should be defined by a path integral over all compact Euclidean metrics without boundary. In other words, the boundary condition of the universe is that it has no boundary. The no boundary condition implies that the laws of physics hold everywhere even at the beginning of the universe. Together with Thomas Hertog, 
Jim and I showed that the no boundary proposal predicts that the universe began with a period of inflation, a prediction which may be confirmed tomorrow, when the data from the Planck satellite are published. I feel a sense of achievement that I have managed to make these contributions, despite having ALS. I have not allowed my disability to stop me doing most things. My motto is there are no boundaries. Thank you. And this is my father, Stephen Hawking. And here's a very nice photograph of him. He's a very brilliant man. He's a theoretical physicist. And that means that he looks for ways to understand the universe around us using the laws of physics. As I said, he's a very brilliant man, and he's the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University. So that's a very long way to say it's the same job that the great scientist Isaac Newton once held. And he's won many awards and been given many honorary degrees. And so you would think that this would have been obvious right from the beginning. Well... This is the part of the talk where we do some time travel. We're going to go back and take a look. So here he is. This is my father as a small boy with his two sisters. And when my father was a young boy and he was at school, his teachers didn't think that much of him. This is a line from one of his school reports. This boy will never amount to anything. But, however, his classmates must have noticed something about him, because they nicknamed him Einstein. And he did grow on to become a scholar, and this just shows that kids are so much cleverer than adults, because he became a scholar, and he went to Oxford University, and he left with a first in honours in physics, and he came to Cambridge to begin his research. Now, around this time, he also found out that he was suffering from a disease. And it's a disease called ALS, and what it does is it slowly takes away your ability to move your muscles. And in later years, it's also taken away his natural speaking voice. And so at the end of the talk, when you hear him talking to you, it will sound like a computer is speaking to you. But it isn't. It's a real man who's using a computer to give himself back the voice that his disease has taken away from him. But fortunately, some good things also happened to my father at this time. He met my mother, and he got engaged, and he got married, and he started work on his thesis. And his thesis was called Properties of Expanding Universes. And as part of his thesis, he managed to prove that the universe must have had a definite beginning. So that's not bad for a bit of postgraduate work, actually. And now, a few years on, and here we are. This is 1970 in Cambridge, and that baby is me. And my parents called me Lucy because the name Lucy comes from the Latin word for light. And light is one of the major studies of astrophysicists, like my father. And so it's a very good name for the daughter of a physicist. And the reason I'm showing you this photo from 1970, 1970 was an important year for my father. He had a eureka moment. And he worked out a very elegant mathematical proof of what happens when two black holes collide. He worked out that when two black holes collide, they join to form a larger black hole, but that they can't split to form two black holes. So as you can tell, I was a very inspirational, thought-provoking baby there. <laughs> now here we are, this is a few years later, and we have moved to Caltech. We're now living in California, in Pasadena, and Caltech is a great center for scientists on the west coast of America. And this is 1974, which is another very important year for my father, because he's working on his realizations about what happens when a star implodes to form a black hole. So we saw the supernova, the great explosion at the end of a star's life a few minutes ago. And what happens if it was a big enough star, then it throws the outer layers off 
and the inner core can collapse on itself to form a black hole. And that's what my father's working on at this point. Now, after this, we go back to England, and my father takes up his professorship at Cambridge. And many, many, many things happen over the intervening years. I grow up, become a teenager. <laughs> my school reports were really not so great either. <laughs> and my father also has a very, very busy time. He writes his best-selling work, A Brief History of Time. Now, this is a book that has sold all over the world, and yet some people claim that not so many people have actually managed to finish it. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why we set to work on our children's books. We set to work to try and add some extra explanation. Now, at that time, my father also had some, some, some fun things going on in his life. He went on The Simpsons. <laughs> um, he really loved being on The Simpsons. He thought that was fabulous, and he really liked the way they gave him a helicopter blades for his wheelchair, but he did say that he's really glad that in real life he's not bright yellow. <laughs> he also did this. He was on Star Trek. Um, he was just visiting the Paramount Studios one day because uh, he was studying, working at Caltech, and they asked him if he'd like a part, and so here he is on the Enterprise with the two greatest scientists of all time, to my mind, Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. Um, and a few more adventures. Here he is in floating in zero gravity, and this is a really lovely picture because if you look at the size of his smile and you think this is a man whose mind has been free to travel across the whole universe, but his body has been confined to a wheelchair for decades by this point. And here he is, he's free and he's floating. Stephen Hawking, the British physicist and mathematician who has had made significant contributions in cosmology is currently the director of research at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology within the University of Cambridge. Despite suffering from a rare life-threatening condition of amyotrophic lateral cellulosis, he is known for his revolutionary prediction that black holes emit radiation, which is now also referred to as Hawking's radiation. As he turned 75 on January 8, 2017, we look back at his life, career, and achievements. Born on January 8, 1942, in Oxford, England, to Frank and Isabel Hawking, he is the eldest of the four children in the family. His father was a medical researcher and mother was one of the first female students to have graduated from Oxford University. While his father wanted him to study medicine, he decided to pursue mathematics. However, as the subject was not taught at the University College, Oxford at that time, he took up physics. He graduated in 1962 and joined Trinity Hall, Cambridge for PhD in cosmology. After getting inspired by mathematician Roger Penrose and his theorem of space-time concept on the entire universe. Soon after joining the university, he started developing the symptoms for amyotrophic lateral cellulosis as the disease that shut down nerves controlling the muscles. He was confined to a wheelchair and the doctors believed he would live for two to three years. In 1965, despite his growing physical disabilities, he went to marry a modern language undergraduate Jane Wilde, with whom he has three children. Robert, Lucy, and Timothy. The couple separated in 1990 and divorced in 1995. After receiving a doctorate degree in 1996, he started working closely with Penrose. In 1968, he became a member of the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. Inspired by Penrose's theories on black holes, he started working on black hole phenomena and postulated what came to be known as the second law of black hole dynamics. In 1974, Hawking made a huge scientific revelation that black hole was not the information vacuum as earlier stated by scientists. He demonstrated how radiation can escape the gravitational force and now the theory is known as the Hawking radiation. The same year, he became a fellow of the Royal Society. Over the years, he received several awards including the Eddington Medal, the Pierce Levin Gold Medal, Danny Heinemann Prize, the Maxwell Prize 
and also the Albert Einstein Medal. In 1979, he was appointed as the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at the Cambridge University. With time, his medical condition got worse and he was unable to feed himself and lost control over his speech. After a tracheometry operation in 1985, Hawking lost his voice completely. David Manson, a computer engineer and Hawking's wife's second husband, customized a speech synthesizer for the scientist's use. In 1988, Hawking published A Brief History of Time, which was a simplified version of cosmology for the masses. The book became an instant bestseller, selling more than 10 million copies in 20 years. After separating from his first wife in 1990, Hawking married to his nurse, Eliane Manson, in 1995. However, the second marriage lasted only for 11 years, and the couple got divorced in 2006. In 1993, he published a collection of essays and lectures, Black Holes and Baby Universes, and other essays as well. It contains topics such as black hole thermodynamics and quantum mechanics. Hawking has appeared as himself in several shows and has portrayed and referenced to in several works of art and publications. He portrayed his own hologram on Star Trek The Next Generation in 1993 and his voice was recorded and used for The Simpsons in 1999. He also used his voice for the 1994 Pink Floyd song Keep Talking. In 2001, he wrote another book on cosmology, The Universe in a Nutshell. It was followed by his work including On the Shoulder of Giants and George's Secret Key to the Universe, written in 2007. In 2009, Hawking made a departure from his earlier proposition that information was lost in a black hole and hence it is not lost and can escape from a black hole and hence it is not lost and conceded that information is returned. although not in the same state. In 2007, Hawking went to a zero-gravity flight in a Boeing 747, which took off from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, USA. In 2009, Hawking retired as Lucasian Professor of Mathematics. By then, he was unable to operate his wheelchair and used cheek muscles to control his speed synthesizer. In 2010, he co-wrote a book with Leonard Laudina titled The Grand Theory. It focused on the universe and the 11 dimensions of M-theory. In the book, Hawking wrote, It is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue torch paper and set the universe going. In an interview with ABC News, he said, One can't prove that God does not exist, but science makes God unnecessary. In 2015, Hawking became a part of the Breakthrough Initiatives, a program funded by Russian billionaire Yuri Miller to research for life in the universe. It is divided into multiple projects such as the Breakthrough Listen, which is a $100 million project that will search 1 million stars for artificial or laser signals, while the Breakthrough Message is a project that initiates to create a message to be representative of humanity and planet Earth. The 2016 program Breakthrough Starshots aims to send series of probes to the nearest star. This is all about Stephen Hawking.